I shall speak of what has come to be called the Middle East Weapons of Mass Destruction Free Zone. And my goal is to both discuss the history and principles of the WMD Free Zone in general, and then address the Saudi view on what Iran can do and Israel can do to help move this important uh, idea forward. The concept of a WMD Free Zone in the Middle East came about at the 17th session of the United Nations General Assembly when in 1963, Egypt first suggested nine conditions for establishing a nuclear weapons free zone in the Middle East. The resolution had four basic principles, all expressed by Egypt. That all states of the region should refrain from producing, acquiring, and possessing nuclear weapons. That the nuclear weapon states should refrain from introducing nuclear weapons into the area or using nuclear weapons against the states in the region that an effective international safeguard system affecting both the nuclear weapon states and the states of the region should be established. And lastly, that the establishment of an NWFZ in the Middle East should not prevent parties from enjoying the benefits of a peaceful uses of atomic energy, especially for economic development. This effort on Egypt's part was obviously directed then at the rising Israeli nuclear program, but the measure did not go far. Then in 1974, Egypt and Iran introduced a second resolution calling for an NWFZ in the Middle East. 138 members uh, approved the resolution with only Israel and Burma abstaining. Then in 1982, Egypt ratified the Non-Proliferation Treaty and in 1986 froze all domestic nuclear programs. This led in 1990 to the United Nations issuing a report showing a degree of commonality in the views of the states in the area, also including those of Iran and Israel. In short, all the states expressed a desire for the region to be free of nuclear weapons. This led then Egyptian President Mubarak to propose a resolution calling upon all states in the Middle East to take practical steps towards the establishment of an effective Ver verifiable Middle East free zone of weapons of mass destruction, nuclear, chemical, and biological, and their delivery systems. And yet, despite all of these efforts, our region today can hardly be called free of weapons of mass destruction. Indeed, the Middle East is the most militarized region in the world today, largely due to the many conflicts that have raged and still rage in the area. While soldiers, tanks, and planes have been growing in number in the area, the Iran-Iraq War from 1980 to 1988, the Second Gulf War in 1991 increased the danger of proliferation in the region of weapons of mass destruction, <coughs> as well as ballistic missiles capable of carrying them. States in the Middle East have sought WMDs for various reasons, including deterrence, arms races with neighbors, the ability to attack or project the ability to attack or to spare the high cost of conventional weapons. The first nation in the region to acquire nuclear capability was Israel. After France in 1956 agreed to provide them with a 24 megaton, megawatt reactor and the chemical processing plant at Dimon. The rest, as they say, is history. The Middle East is also close to the Indian and Pakistani nuclear missile threats. Both countries conducted multiple nuclear tests in May 1998, and these, along with their advanced missile and space programs, have affected our region. Both nations now have missiles capable of reaching the Middle East, and both conduct, between quotation marks, military diplomacy in the region, sharing information and techniques. Finally, the Indian Navy has held several naval exercises with countries in our part of the world, including Kuwait, Iran, Oman, and Saudi Arabia. And of course, most recently, there is Iran, whose ambition to acquire nuclear weapons has changed the strategic realities of the region. How Saudi Arabia sees a potential end to this crisis through Iran's vocal support of a WMD free zone in the Middle East will inform the rest of my presentation today. Ladies and gentlemen, Saudi Arabia and Iran are equally positioned, are uniquely positioned to be rivals. 
Saudi Arabia has the world's greatest petroleum reserves, Iran the second. Saudi Arabia is custodian of the two holy mosques and the birthplace of Islam, and as such feels it is the eminent leader of the wider Muslim world. Iran portrays itself as the leader of not just the Shiite world, but of all Muslim revolutionaries interested in standing up to the West. Yet at the heart of this deep ideological canyon, other than Saudi Arabia's continued insistence that Iran must stop meddling in the affairs of other nations are Iran's nuclear ambitions. Iran's provocative cat and mouse game with the international community in its nuclear intentions raises tensions and increases suspicions of those intentions. Saudi Arabia firmly believes that it is in every nation's interest, including Iran itself, that they do not develop a nuclear weapon. This is why, through various initiatives, we are sending messages to Iran that it is their right, as it is any nation's right, and as we ourselves are doing, to develop a civilian nuclear program. But that trying to parlay that program into nuclear weapons is a dead end, and that wiser choices will, reside, will result in wider riches. A zone free of weapons of mass destruction is the best means to get Iran and Israel to give up nuclear weapons. Such a zone must be accompanied by a rewards regime that provides economic and technical support for countries that join. But also a nuclear security umbrella guaranteed by the permanent members of the Security Council. It should include a sanctions regime that puts economic and political sanctions on countries that don't join but also military sanctions against those countries that try to develop weapons of mass destruction, also guaranteed by the permanent members of the Security Council. Fortunately, the measures being directed at Iran from a variety of directions seem to be achieving their intended aim of slowing its progress in gaining such weapons. That issue is debatable. But I agree with Secretary Clinton when she said that sanctions are working. I also heartily agree with those in the international community who possess the blessed wisdom to know that military strikes would be entirely counterproductive. Indeed, it is important to remember that there are other non-military policy interventions and alternatives as yet unexplored that could have the desired result without the unwanted consequences. These policy alternatives would capitalize on the vulnerability of the Iranian government, whose hold on power is only possible if it is able, as it barely is now, to maintain a level of economic prosperity that is just enough to pacify its people. To put the government's vulnerability into perspective vis-a-vis -vis our own, with only one-third of the population, Saudi Arabia makes three and a half times the oil revenue of Iran. Yet oil, re oil revenues account for around 50% of Iranian government revenues. This is to say that Iran is very vulnerable in the oil sector. And it is there that more could be done to squeeze the, cur the current government to join the world in efforts towards peace. Yet I'm not here today to solely call upon Iran to end its nuclear weapons program or to discuss the means currently on the table to help them realize that this is a wise, wise route to take. I'm here today to make a simple appeal, and that is to call upon the Iranian government to vocally support what it introduced in the United Nations General Assembly in 1974, and that is a weapons of mass destruction free zone in the Middle East. If it would only take this step, then the pre-negotiation stage of a WMD free zone proposals we have seen over these many decades could move into actual treaty negotiations. With Iran's support, and who doubts that such support would bring great benefit to that nation and its people and its neighbors, we would be able to begin discussing realistic perspectives and new formulas for addressing the issue of nuclear weapons in the region. The United Nations Review Conference on the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty held last year has designated next year, 2012, 
to hold a conference on the WMD free zone. Discussions could begin, <coughs> confidence and security building measures could be implemented, and, two, and track two talks could shift into bilateral and multilateral official discussions. In these discussions, arms control measures would be linked with a political timetable. This would require transparency by all states concerning conventional and unconventional weapons and would follow a three-phase approach as already outlined by the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research. The first phase would be called no first use. In this phase, confidence would be built and the region's proliferation would be prevented. States would commit themselves to a creation of a WMD free zone as well as discuss what it fe its features would be. Inspections and verification regimes would be discussed, with the creation of a special verification regime being established to allow for mutual, reciprocal, and intrusive inspections of both a routine and challenging nature. Also stated, stated would be the conditions under which states would be willing to give up their WMDs, as well as a no first use commitment by all parties. Finally, connections between conventional delivery systems and WMDs would be clearly delineated. Phase two would initiate a capping of each nation's weapons of mass destruction arsenal. This would mean effective and verifiable measures would be established. Practical caps on Israel's nuclear capabilities would be determined, and Iran would also participate in freezing its goal of acquiring more WMD capabilities. Finally, from these efforts would come phase three, the establishment of a Middle East weapons of mass destruction free zone. All WMDs would be phased out over a period of time. Some would be eliminated immediately, while others would be eliminated once full normalization of relations is achieved and different economic and functional cooperation are realized. And through that process, our region would arrive at a time far less threatening to life and civilization than the one in which we currently exist. Yet none of this will be possible without Iran's and Israel's vocal support. That is quite literally the missing piece in the puzzle, which should, should it fall in place, could institute a new era of cooperation and disarmament in our area. Therefore, I call on Israel and Iran to give this vocal support. I call on Israel and Iran to choose peace over war, cooperation over isolation, and prosperity over impoverishment. Nothing good can come of a nuclear arsenal. It is a fortress built in fear, yet it is a fortress that inevitably isolates its makers to such an extent all that they then know is fear and then all they can do is fight. Where is the victory, the riches, the good life in this scenario? It is no. With weapons of mass destruction, all is paranoia and hostility. Much has been made of the face-off now existing between the Arab world, Iran, and Israel. Yet it is time to start talking about how this face-off can come to an end. And one way that can happen is for our nations to join together in common cause on the creation of a WMD free zone in the Middle East. Peace with Israel can be part and parcel of this effort. The time is now. The threat is clear. We have everything to gain and nothing to lose. Let us drop our differences and find mutual benefit in waging peace for ourselves, for our nations, and for our children. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.